the same experience of uh, life changes quickly. Uh, we can be heading down one way, and suddenly things just, things just change. Uh, you can be heading to a Springbok game, and just before half time, you get a heart attack. Uh, you could be walking down the beachfront, and suddenly someone grabs you. You can be planning your day, and something suddenly something happens. What we're talking about this morning is uh, when you feel like this man. Uh, you know, you've got a plan. You know, this guy woke up that morning and said, I'm going for a surf. I'm going to go catch waves, and I'm going to get barrels, and I'm going to have a great time. Uh, needless to say, he didn't have a great time. Uh, the, the, uh, the wave just kind of fell below him. Uh, and sometimes life feels like that. The, the, the floor has collapsed under your feet. And so today we're going to be talking about those left turns and detours uh, where you've got a plan, or maybe you even heard God saying, go here, do this, and things just fall apart. Maybe those times in life when you, you, thought you thought you heard God's voice and you start to even doubt his existence or doubt his love. And so today, today is part two of last week's part one where we unpacked how God is more interested in who we are than where we go and what we do. That God wants us to be connected and transformed uh, back into the image of his son rather than just to have the right job and be in the right place and, and marry the right person and, and have the right stuff uh, because we, we created to reflect Jesus. And so when God, uh, when, when we die, when, when God uh, has us as the judgment throne, he's not going to take the, the checklist, you know, did Rob live in the right place? Uh, did Rob do the right stuff? Did Rob do this, do that? What is he going to look at? Did Rob accept Jesus? That's the only thing he's going to look at. And that was in verse 29, Romans 8, 29. So I'm just going to read verses 28 and 29 of Romans chapter 8 again. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And so when we read verse 28, uh, who of you have heard verse 28 before? God can work all things. Yeah? It's quite a popular verse. Uh, it is uh, posted on calendars, on mugs, and it is a great verse. I'm not, I'm not uh, saying it is a, a, a silly verse, but I have found in my experience of people reading this verse that... Uh, they don't read it with verse 29. So what does the good of those who love God look like? Uh, if you just have verse 28, and you look at verse 28, what are, what are some of the things that maybe the good would look like? When we say we want good in our lives, what, what are we wanting? Health? Yeah. That's a big one. Wealth, yeah, there we go. Anything from this side? Anything that we, health and wealth? Sorry, Rob? Good governance. Yeah, that, yeah that's a big one. Good governance. Uh, we want our children to be safe. We want our grandchildren to be safe. Um, some of us, we want our pets to be safe. Um, we, we, we want our comfort in this world. We don't want bad things to happen to us. And so when we reflect on verse 28, if we just have verse 28, as, as sweet as it sounds, I don't think that's what Paul is telling us. Because in verse 29, last week, what was the most important thing? Our earthly comfort or our eternal salvation? Because no matter how much wealth you accumulate or how much health you accumulate, that's not going to be taken with you into eternity. What's going to be taken into eternity is your salvation. And so with verse 29, what is good here is not all necessarily our health and wealth, but our salvation and our sanctification. And so God is going to work all things to make sure you are saved and sanctified. And as a byproduct, you might have health and wealth, but God is not promising us health and wealth here. He's, he's promising us salvation and sanctification 
And what's the main way that we are generally saved and sanctified? When do people go to Jesus? When they get given a million dollars or when a million dollars is taken away from them? When life is tough. That's generally when people are driven to Jesus. What causes growth is fiery trials. Those left turns and detours, and I'm going to repeat it at the, at the end again. We mustn't, we mustn't be you know, praying in the... Well, I don't think the message is in the morning we should pray, Jesus, please give me a left turn today so that I can be driven to you. But when a left turn happens, it's not because God has let go of the reins and doesn't love you anymore. He might be wanting to do some remedial work in your lives. So what does it really mean that God will work all things? Does, what's God's relationship to evil? And we, we read the end of the story of Joseph. Uh, Joseph is a great Sunday school story. It, it requires um, some fantastic coloring in opportunities uh, with, the, with the coat uh, and the Egypt images and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but Joseph had a life of so many left turns and detours. So he was a, a young teenager, probably around the age of 16, uh, if we can recall back then, at the age of 16. And he was, he was with his family. He, had, he was the youngest. He had all his older brothers. And he was the favorite. He was the absolute favorite. He, he was the guy that the, that the dad loved above all his other children. And so his brothers said, no, this guy, he must, he must get out of here. You know, we, we, we don't like this favorite son of ours favorite brother of ours. So they devised to go take him out into the wilderness and they found, a, they, well, they first wanted to kill him. Uh, and then the one guy said, no, well, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him into a well. And then they threw him into the well and then they saw some, some merchants coming by. So he, they sold him off into slavery, uh, took his coat, dipped it in some animal blood and went back to his dad and said, you know, something happened to your son. We don't know. At the age of 17. Needless to say, by the age of 39, he met his family again. It's a long time, 17 to 39. And in that time, he had gone from being second in command of Pharaoh to being in jail uh, to being accused of rape and sexual uh, issues. Uh, he had been uh, marked again as the second in command of Pharaoh. Uh, he had this life of up and down, and as it seemed to be going right, he gets chucked into jail. As it seems he gets going it right, something else just falls apart. And this is the, the, quite a constant theme within the scriptures. You've got the story of Job. You've got the story of, of Jesus. You've got the story of John uh, in exile. But one thing that the scripture is very clear on. God is not the instigator of evil. God is not the one causing the evil, but nor is he powerless in the face of evil. God is so powerful that he can use evil for good. And how can he use evil for good? Is He's sovereign. Uh, sovereign means if you share a quarter of a percentage of power with any other being, you are not sovereign. Sovereignty is all powerful. Uh, all encompasses all. And so if there was another being or another force or another something in this world that shared a form of power over reality, God would cease to be sovereign. He would cease to be God. And so God is all powerful. Satan and God are not interlocked in a cosmic battle. Satan is destroyed. In, Genesis, uh, in, in Revelation, uh, Satan gathers all his armies, a, a formidable force, a force that would destroy humanity. And Jesus just arrives in the battlefield and Satan is destroyed. There's no comparison. God is not sidelined or, you know, oh, well, I didn't see that happening. I mean, in the story of Job, he's, God is the one that said to Satan, hey, have you considered my servant Job? He's holy. And Satan's like, well, he's only holy because you haven't given him any fiery trials. And so God's like, well, go test him. God was the one that suggested to Satan to go to Job. 
So what is God's relationship to evil? He doesn't, uh, he doesn't purpose it, but he uses it. He's sovereign. And so when we are seen, in the, or when life has these left turns, left turns and detours, I'm, I'm not saying that we should desire it. I'm not saying that we should look forward to it. I mean, I'm sure that when Joseph was chucked into the well, he wasn't like, you know, praise Jesus. I'm chucked into a well. I'm out, of the, I'm out of the sun. I'm in the shade. But we should see them as an opportunity to grow. We should see them as an opportunity to be used in God's sovereignty. You know, God, what are you doing in my life? And I don't want to trivialize the pain and heartbreak and struggles that, that left turns cause. But I want us to keep in mind Joseph in Romans 28 because when something happens in life when it feels like the, the, the platform of life has just fallen away. If you aren't reminded that God is in control, you can fall so easily into depression and alcoholism and, and the, the, the captures of the world. And so I'm, I'm skipping a lot of pastoral counseling things here. You know, you don't just, if, if, if something happens, you know, if, if, uh, well, let's use a personal example. If someone comes and kills Tara later today, you can't just come and tell me straight off the bat what God's doing a remedial work in your life. Praise Jesus. I'll probably punch you. you you've, you've got to do it in a, in, a, in a process, but it would be wrong to not tell me that God is doing a remedial work because I've got to know the truth. Because if, if you don't tell me that, I'm probably going to turn to alcohol. I'm probably going to turn to a promiscuous life. I'm probably going to leave the church. So you've got to tell me the truth, but in the right way. But what I'm doing today is just giving you the framework. You've got to work out the hard stuff yourself. And so the, the framework is do the right thing always. That's the right response. When, when a left turn happens, when you find yourself in a pickle, you, you find yourself, you know, the, the, the floor of reality is, is, is gone. You know, you, God, you said go here, and then suddenly something happens. You're like, but you told me. Go here, and now I don't know where I am anymore. The right response, the right response to God and to others. Uh, Adam, you know, when Adam was by himself and, and God said, you know, it shouldn't be right for him to be alone. And he created woman. Uh, he created Eve. And a couple of uh, verses later, they, they fell. And Adam's words to God was, the, the woman you created. The woman you created. The two parties that usually get blamed when life turns into pickle. It's God and others. And so our res right response to God is uh, to pray to him. Pray to him openly. Uh, if you're struggling to pray to God openly, go read through the Psalms. If you are in a lament, go read through Psalm 13. Uh, go read through some of the Psalms. And, and if, if you can't unpack what your heart truly feels to other people, you can to God. Because God is the only one that loves you unconditionally, eternally, and knows exactly what's on your heart. So if you are irritated with God or doubt his love or doubt his existence and you pray God I love you I know you there you can't fool God you can fool me you can fool a spouse you can fool a friend you can fool the pastor but you cannot fool God be honest with him if, if he's if, if you feel hurt by him or let down by him or you know or, or whatever feeling you're feeling tell him Tell them openly. If you, if you read through the Psalms, they don't hinder their language. Sometimes the, the psalmists are pretty brutal uh, with their language. The one psalmist uh, calls for his enemies' babies to be smashed upon the rocks. That's a lot of anger right there. We should be praying and, and we should be asking God, you know, God, I know you're in control. I know you love me. And what are you trying to teach me? What must I do? What, what is the remedial work you're doing in my life? And you must have the right response to others. It's not harm for harm. It's not eye for eye. 
Uh, I, I love movies, um, as you guys might know. Uh, I absolutely love movies. And there's some deep sense of, uh, of desire when, when the main hero, something bad happens to him or her, and the rest of the movie is him or her exacting revenge. And you get so excited, you know, like, yes, die, bad people, die. You, know, you, you get so excited about this revenge. But life, the, the, the biblical paradigm shouldn't be re- a life of revenge. A biblical paradigm should mean that you be reconciled, that you sometimes turn the other cheek, sometimes you overlook an offense. But if an offense is too great, I'm not saying that the Christian life should be boundaryless or a punching bag. Uh, that's an ungodly life, I would say. Uh, a, a, a godly life has a firm boundary and you know, Jesus says, if, if, if another brother or sister has offended you, you must go speak to them. You must go be reconciled. You must uh, have a love for social justice. You must care for the poor, fight for the orphan and the widow. You must stand firm against the, the schemes of Satan. You must have the right response to others. Uh, I don't know whether I would respond as Joseph responded to his brothers. Genesis chapter 50, uh, verse 20. He's now 20 years on from when his brothers threw him into the well, wanted to kill him, and sold him into slavery. And that means 20 years of not seeing family, not really having a purpose with his family and and now his brothers are standing before him and now his second command of pharaoh if he just snaps his fingers and says these guys are dead they're dead there's a lot of a lot of potential for revenge here a lot of potential for a a life of going guys you wrong me and now i'm in the seat of power and i'm going to take you out but he says verse 20 You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. And so that's our second thing that we must remember. There's always two stories. There's our limited story, and then there's God's picture. From Joseph's perspective, he was in jail. From God's perspective, things were going exactly according to plan. When we can't see God's control, it doesn't mean that he's not in control. We know from Scripture that God is. And sometimes we just have to accept that. When we are faced with a detour, when we are faced with a, God, what on earth are you doing? Have you lost the reins? We can, we can stand in assurance that God has not lost the reins because he's promised us regularly within Scripture. In, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that he will work all things for the good of those who love him. All things, evil and good, all things for the good of those who love him. And so when, when, you, when you're standing at this time when life falls apart, remember Joseph, remember how uh, from his perspective things are going bad, but from God's perspective things are going right. And, and isn't this the story of Job? Job is being taken apart But from God's perspective, things are going exactly to plan. When Jesus is being taken to the cross and dying for the sins of the world, and and ultimate evil is, is, is destroyed the God, the Son. From God's perspective, things are going as planned. When John, the disciple, is on the, the, the island of Patmos, on exile, and the rest of the disciples are being killed, and, and hundreds of disciples around the known world are being killed for for their faith, and and John gets taken up into heaven, and before the throne is a sea of glass. God's plan was going exactly to plan. So how how can God do this? I thought he was loving. He is. He loves you so much that he doesn't just want to give you health and wealth. He wants to give you eternal salvation. He wants to spend eternity with you. He doesn't just want you to have... A, a, a comfortable life here for a finite amount of time, as much as that might sound sweet, he wants you to spend eternity with him. And so he will, that, that, that's his ultimate purpose. He wants you to be saved, not just 
comfortable here. So he will do everything he can so that you can be saved and sanctified. And so please, I'm not trying to trivialize the pain and the heartbreak of left turns and detours. And I know that if it, something has just happened and it is still raw in your heart, the last thing you want to think of is, God did this. God is doing something in my life. It takes time. But don't evade that truth. And so this week, as we, as we leave, uh, things will happen. Uh, we live in a, in a fallen world. And maybe something has already happened in which you just have, that, have those questions in your mind. You're like, God, what on earth are you doing? Why did that person die? Why was this job taken away from me? This person that I married was not who I thought. You, know, you, you told me to move here, and now something's fallen apart. You know, why did I move? Why did I do this? Why did I do that? Why did you tell me to go here? Know that God is in control, even when you can't see it. Always do what is right. Because God will work for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. And so this morning, if you haven't yet, respond in love for God. Because the hard truth is, if you don't love Him, God can't work for the good for you. For we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. So do you love God this morning? Uh, do you have a personal relationship with him? Do you know him as your personal Lord and Savior? Because if you don't, God cannot work for the good of your life. Because you don't know him. You're not saved. You're not sanctified. But if you do know him, he can work for the good of your life. And so maybe this morning, maybe, you, maybe you, something has happened. Maybe a left turn happened a while back. And you started to doubt God's love. You started to doubt his existence. You started to doubt that, that he's around, that he has a relationship with you. Maybe this morning you need to come back like the prodigal son. Maybe this morning you've ever doubted that God ever existed or that the Christian faith uh, is the, the, the right faith. Maybe this morning you need to confess for the first time your sins and, and come to the throne of grace and to confess your love for Jesus. And maybe you've stood firm for a long time in your faith and you just need to reaffirm and establish that faith this morning. So in our, in our closing song, may you just respond in faith and love to the God that loves you, that loves you so much he sent his son to die for you so that he can spend eternity with you. So that when you, like this guy, caught in life, caught in the traps of life, and you just have no idea what is going on, that God gives you his, his view from heaven as he did John and say, don't worry. Don't be anxious about everything, but with prayer and petition, present your requests to God. So Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for your amazing love. We thank you that you have uh, given us your spirit, that you've given us your word, that we can trust you, that you will work all things for the good of those who love you, that you desire ultimately our salvation and our sanctification, not just our earthly comfort. You desire things that are eternal and, and infinite rather than limited and, and just here in our space and time. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that through your Spirit you save and sanctify those here this morning. And, Lord, I pray that you help us to trust you as we go out into this week when left turns and detours happen, that you help us to do what is right and that you uh, 
Uh, help us to see that you are in control. Help us to see your side of the story. And so, Lord Jesus, I just pray this in your most holy and glorious name. Amen.